Hello, everyone. It's the last night, the last night. I'm sad, a little sad, but it's been such an amazing week. And um, one of the things I talked about early on was that we are the College of the Atlantic, after all. Leaning into the ocean makes all the sense in the world for COA as an institution. The other thing that's very important to us is our geography in the state of Maine, right? So the college, we have 370 students thereabouts. They come from 55 countries across the world and 42 U.S. states. Only about 15% are from Maine, but 30% stay in Maine. So this is like a, a reverse brain drain, right? And that was a planned lead up to our special guest, if that wasn't obvious enough. But um, we do have a very special guest this evening who wanted to address us. And I'd like you all to welcome Governor Janet Mills. Thank you. Wow. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could have joined you for the past several days and uh, listened to all the great uh, presentations you've had and done a little kayaking with you in the bay and around the islands, <coughs> Porcupine Islands. I hope you've identified every one of them. Well, what you're doing is part of my administration's agenda, of course, looking at the science of the seas, and the ecology and the environment. We know that for more than 80 years, scientists have warned us that we're changing our climate. Scientists' concerns have become a steady drumbeat <clears throat> with the data getting more and more serious, voices becoming louder with every extreme storm, every fire. London this week was 104 degrees, the highest temperature ever in about 400 years at least every change on the thermometer, every ocean wave that creeps further on shore, warmer and warmer. Now scientists are calling climate change a code red for humanity. That alarm is echoed by a growing chorus here in Maine and elsewhere. Farmers whose fields are dry, communities whose streets are underwater, fishermen whose oceans are warming, youth who are fearful about the world we are leaving, leaving to them, and loudest still, the courageous people who are determined to do something about it. People like Sylvia Earle, renowned marine scientist and deep sea diver, great individual, who warned that, quote, it is high time for the high seas, the blue half of the world, to be recognized as the blue heart of the planet, the cornerstone of, the life, of Earth's life support system, the vast but vulnerable part of our planet. And this week, <coughs> excuse me, we add our voices and you add your voices to inspire action against the threat of climate change. Maine is working hard to bolster the resiliency of our communities, to create clean energy, green collar jobs, to build a clean energy economy and support Maine families and communities transition away from expensive, harmful fossil fuels to homegrown renewable energy but we need the help of everyone here. It might be easier to put off climate change until calmer times or better econ economic times, but Maine can't wait. Maine shouldn't wait. And as I told the United Nations General Assembly session on climate change two, three years ago, Maine won't wait. And that is, in fact, the title of our Climate Action Plan. I hope you all get a chance to look at it online. Maine Won't Wait, Maine's four-year climate action plan. So may this, these sessions move you to not wait, but to take steps in your own lives and preserve our planet. For my part, my administration will continue to do all we can against climate change and protect this place that we love and call home so that generations to come may enjoy it as much as we do today. So welcome to Maine, those of you who haven't been here before or who haven't lived here.
consider coming here and staying here. We would welcome you. Welcome home. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Steve Katona, and I have the honor and privilege of introducing our conversants tonight. So I want to thank all of you for coming to the final event of the 2022 COA Summer Institute, our one and only ocean. And I hope that uh, you've had a chance to come to a number of the sessions, if not all, and that you've found them as fertile as I have inspiring new thoughts and future actions, and hope that better accord between people and oceans may be possible. The oceans provide a very long list of ecosystem services. That's the fancy word for benefits to people. And the speakers over this week have touched on a number of them, provisioning services such as food, regulating services including regulation of oxygen and CO2 and climate, supporting services such as the primary production that drives all ocean productivity, and coastal erosion control by those wonderful oysters, and cultural services, including recreation, education, aesthetic enjoyment, tourism, creative inspiration for literature, and visual arts, including film. And we've seen examples of all of those during the week. The central role of communication was emphasized numerous times. Science is necessary, but not sufficient. Effective communication is essential because it alone can engage our ears, eyes, and minds. Facts matter, but story is the fertilizer needed for facts to thrive and spread. We've heard some of the ocean community's most gifted narrative and visual storytellers bring to life the horrors of the slave trade, destruction of coastlines, the scourge of plastics, the perils confronting both right whales and lobster fishers, and a number of others. But they've also showed the ocean's beauty, diversity, and resilience, demonstrated paths toward solutions, and drawn us in to become part of them. We've been cheered by the central role of women throughout the week and the growing presence of black marine scientists, educators, and storytellers. Just as all genders and colors are represented in the ocean, so should they be in the discovery and telling of its stories. Today's discussants continue some of those themes. Susan and David Rockefeller serve on the board of directors of Oceana, about which you've heard um, earlier in other sessions, but they're also advocates, activists, and practitioners of sustainable agriculture. Susan tells her stories visually as a director and producer of documentary films, as an author, as a jeweler, as a founder of Musings Magazine, which highlights the stories of small businesses whose missions enhance conservation, health, food systems, and other sustainable goals. It's published twice a month, you can find it on the web. Just look for Musings Magazine. David is an advocate for natural, national parks, and he founded Sailors for the Sea to engage boat owners to participate in citizen science through marine sampling and recording observations made at sea. And we've heard other examples of wonderful involvement of citizens in science. Susan and David will be in conversation with Sam Waterston, who's well known to us as an actor with 80 film and television credits, stage work on and off Broadway, numerous acting awards, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. If you can convincingly be Lincoln, Hamlet, Prospero, Robert Oppenheimer, and many more, you can tell and sell a story. And what better story for avocational work than the ocean. Sam's abiding dedication to marine conservation 
which he now expresses as chairman of the board of Oceana, was forged by witnessing the decline and demise of the Atlantic cod fishery, which had been America's leading marine resource at the time of his birth. There's lots more we could say about Sam, but I want to mention my favorite uh, Sam Waterston production, which is Grace and Frankie. <laughs> hey, right. In which Sam and co stars Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Martin Sheen address serious issues of aging, sexuality, family, friendship in hilarious fashion. I love that. But I equally love this. All are dedicated activists willing to put themselves on the line for urgent causes. Jane Fonda was first arrested in 1970 <laughs> on bogus charges for her anti-war activism during the Vietnam War era. She's subsequently been arrested five times during Fire Deal Friday's uh, demonstrations outside the US Capitol that she organized to protest the Trump administration's inaction on climate change. <laughs> Lily Tomlin has been arrested once and Sam Waterston twice at those <laughs> demonstrations. Sam could have broadened his lead over Lily had he been arrested for helping disrupt the 2019 Harvard-Yale game as a demonstration demanding that the universities divest their holdings in fossil fuel companies. But alas. <laughs> Martin Sheen, uh, I, I mentioned here that uh, Frank Gracie and, uh, Grace and Frankie has much more diversity than meets the eye. Martin Sheen recently expressed regret over changing his birth name, which was Ramon Antonio Gerardo Estevez, for his stage name. But he has, I believe, an unchallengeable lead with 66 arrests <laughs> since 1986 for civil disobedience while protesting atomic weapons, inaction on climate, and ocean issues. And you may know that one of Sea Shepherd's ships is named for him. I salute Sam and his co-stars, not just for their acting skills, which continue to educate and enlighten us, but also for their courage, advocacy, and peaceful activism, embodying John Lewis's injunction, speak up, speak out, get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America, and here we may inject in the health of the ocean. So please join me in welcoming Susan, David, and Sam. So after an introduction like that, it seems to me we should just go to dinner. For <laughs> <laughs> Q&A. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, are you going to wear that bib? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, good. <laughs> I've had my dinner. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, Governor Mills, wonderful to have you here and uh, to hear you. And uh, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. That's fantastic. Where are you? Oh, there you are. And thank you, Darren and Steve, for your great leadership of this wonderful institution, the College of the Atlantic. Here we are in the final hour of the Summer Institute. And uh, Susan and I are so proud and pleased to be with Sam Waterston, whom we now consider a good friend, having served on the board with him of Oceanus, Susan longer than I, but both of us for a good period. And uh, he is just a remarkable leader, a wonderful chair. Thank you, Sam, so much. So let's get into it. Um, you know, each of us, 
here tonight, uh, being within a few hundred yards of the ocean, can certainly remember the first time that you saw it, that you interacted with it, that you uh, hopefully fell in love with it. And very few of us during that early love phase knew anything about, certainly true for me, what the problems were under the surface. Um, Susan fell in love with the oceans principally by diving in it from the beaches of Long Island, which was near where she grew up. Uh, I first fell in love with it more by playing on the surface as a sailor. Um, and I'm curious, Sam, what's your love story with the ocean? How did it start for you? Well, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good evening, Governor. Um, I think the, the first thing that I'd like to say about it, f falling in love with the oceans is that it's not a serious thing, not to begin with. It's, uh, it's a spontaneous thing, um, and, it's, and it's synonymous with fun. I, I, was, I was blessed, as I bet many of you were too, to have spent my childhood summers on the beach in New England. Um, and I didn't think about anything except getting a tan on. I spent a very long time trying to get a tan on one side without getting it on the other. <laughs> I, I, I spent a very long time surfing in the ocean, body surfing, um, being challenged by the ocean, going fishing in the ocean. And, and Lynn, my wife is here, and she reminded me just before I came up on the stage that our, our fishing boat, our sailing boat, our little tiny sailing dinghy was named the Me Too, and my father named it the Me Too because I was um, the third child and the other two wanted to do things without me, and one of them was going sailing, and I, I perpetually was saying, Me Too, Me Too, Me Too. So, so that's how, you know, and that, nobody asks any questions about that or even really thinks about it. I, I had a, a friend, now we don't live right next to the sea, and the lawn in front of our house has a nice little slope that runs down, and a friend of mine was up there visiting with his wife and two children, and our children and their children were all rolling down this nice lawn, and, and Jim turned to me and said, they think it's always like this. And I think that's what I thought about the oceans, that it was always going to be like that. And when I was growing up, there was absolutely plenty of everything, because I was born in 1940. And 1940, was the beginning of World War II, and World War II forced uh, a quiet time on the oceans, to which the oceans responded as the oceans do, by reproducing like bandits. And so by the end of World War II, there was more of every kind of fishy thing than you could possibly imagine. And and I, I can't remember whether it was 25 cents or a dollar when my mother drew the line and refused to buy another lobster until the prices came down. <laughs> but, but, there, but it was cheap and plentiful, and, and the other um, impact of World War II was that sonar and radar were now available to apply to fishing. And what that has meant, as Dr. Daniel Pauly, somebody, somebody who was speaking about black marine scientists, I think Dr. Yeah. Daniel Pauly might be one of the pioneers in that world, and, and he's also on the board of Oceana, and an absolutely magnificent human being, and a very, very wise man. Um, but why did I bring him up? About the about the sonar. Oh, yes. So he, he like, thank you. 
you know, <laughs> I don't know if I have time for this, but, but um, a few minutes ago, the one thing I really didn't expect to have happen when I came to Maine was heat stroke. <laughs> but, Gatorade. but Gatorade will probably kick in and pretty soon I might be able to remember my own name. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, sonar and radar, as Dr. Daniel Pauly likes to say, made it, made it true that there is no place in the ocean for any fish to hide. And, and in my youth, the impact of that was, well, then there's just plenty more of everything, isn't there? Because, and there was a scientific theory at the time that the, that the sea was an inexhaustible resource. Well, human beings have been testing that theory ever since, and it's clear. You, you can. And that was what the experience of being a kid on Cape Cod turned into in like 1970 or whenever it was that the new, I was reading the newspaper on a beach in Matunic, Rhode Island, and they announced that they had closed the, uh, they, had, they had closed the cod fisheries in Canada and down the, down the East Coast. The cod fisheries. So, I was born in Massachusetts, the, the most obvious geographical identifier of Massachusetts is Cape Cod. And nobody thinks of Cape Cod as being named after a fish any more than anybody thinks of Boston as being named after some place in England. But we came here from Europe for the fish. And, and Thoreau wrote about being able to walk from your boat to the shore without getting your feet wet because the cod were so thick in the coves. So that was really a galvanizing event for me. That was a longer answer than you were bargaining for. <laughs> no, that was a great answer. I just want to also say hi to everybody here. Um, it's great to see so many faces that we recognize, and also just a great shout out to Darren for organizing this incredible Summer Institute, to Governor Mills for being here. Um, just, you know, Steve Catona loved your remarks. They were fabulous. And, um, you know, also thinking if anyone has not read Daniel Pauly's work, he also has a biography out, um, really fascinating story about a black man and his journey um, into being this very renowned scientist who works out of uh, University of British Columbia. And what he said to me that always resonates is that we are waging a war on the fish, on the ocean, because of all the sonar, and the fish are losing, and it's, they have nowhere, as you said, to hide. And I just want to say one of the reasons why we love what Oceana does is that we are working to protect and help to rebound a lot of those fish resources through science and advocacy and protecting fish habitat and enforcing fish regulations and minimizing bycatch. So, um, you know, all of us, and I, I just reflecting on what you were saying, and David as a sailor, and I love to swim. I know that there's some of my mermaid swimmers out here in the crowd. We go swimming. Um, that you love, what you love, you end up wanting to protect. And I, too, have these seminal memories and, and love of family time with my brother and my sister and my parents by the ocean. And I think so much of, of the experiences that we have really end up informing us in terms of the activism that we end up uh, you know, focused on. So the next question, I would like to kind of pivot a little bit. Um, and you know, we know, you know there's Sam the man, there's Sam the actor, there's Sam the activist. 
And um, we've been very fortunate to know Sam. Um, I mean, we all sort of feel like we know him because of all of his amazing, <laughs> you know, his acting and, and all the things that we've seen. But, um, and then we get to see Sam and his brilliant activism as the chair, chairman of Oceana. But I'd be very curious to have you share with the audience more about the foundational values and the, the sort of roots of, like your, almost like your origin story, your family, what kind of prompted you um, on the journey toward uh, your education and your acting and your activism? How far back do you want to go? <laughs> so my, my mother uh, was from Boston and she, and she was a painter, a wonderful painter, and a, a grand eccentric, and an art teacher. And my father was um, a teacher of romance languages and semantics and English and it was just, uh, it was a guarantee that you were going to be a modest person if he was going to be your father because, <laughs> because he, was, he was such a greatly, beautifully civilized man. Um, and we grew up um, on, the, on the fringes of the campus of a boarding school in Massachusetts. And he, he directed the, the plays there. And one year there was a part for a very small boy. And he had one line and, and it was, uh, Five o'clock, sir, a cabinet meeting, sir. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yes, obviously, he, he cast me in the show. And it was something else. You're drunk with sleep because you're way up, way past your proper bedtime. And the, Everything's dark except the bright lights on the stage. And all the heroes of the school are up there acting. And then, wake up, Sam, it's your turn, and, and you're up there with them. And I think that's probably why I became an actor. Um, but I had, other, I had other sort of threshold or turning point experiences. Uh, um, I went to boarding school. Um, I wanted to play Cyrano when they did a production of Cyrano de Bergerac, and they cast somebody else. And frustration is a great motivator. I, I, I was hugely in favor of having people say no to you about things that you really want, because um, it, it kind of I, you know, I kind of got on, I'm going to show them attitude. And, and then when I was at Yale, I took with me the advice of a school teacher from my boarding school, uh, warning about the terrors and horrors of show business. And so I, I kind of tried to stay away from it. I was cast as lucky and waiting for Godot in an absolutely fabulous production. The whole bunch of people um, who became important people in the theater after that. Uh, and it scared me because it was so exciting. And I spent my junior year in France and I thought I won't I won't uh, be an actor, I'll have nothing to do with it. And I went to the, uh, what's it called? The, the, uh, on the Boulevard Raspail, the American, the Centre Américain pour, je ne sais pourquoi. Uh, and I was there uh, to be studently, and some people showed up and they were, 
they were going to take acting classes and would I like to join? And oh, well, I'll go listen. And, and uh, John Barry was the teacher and he was a genius teacher and, and so I went into show business. <laughs> And what about the activism part? When did you feel that um, you had a mission beyond engaging the audience uh, in whatever theatrical piece you were uh, in at the time? Isn't it true, aren't we all, as Americans, raised with the habit of mind that we're supposed to stay informed and be up to date? Don't um, isn't that, wasn't that, didn't all of you get that as kids? You, wasn't it part of your responsibility just as an ordinary citizen? And, and then, <laughs> and then doesn't it get frustrating to read the paper and see how Things don't change, it's certainly not in the direction that you were hoping or not fast enough. And so it starts to just get built into your system that it would be great to do something. And, and then, here's, here's my advice to everybody, when somebody asks you to get involved, say yes. The governor was asking people to get involved earlier today. The, the, just say yes. Um, and that's what happened to me. I made a movie, uh, The Killing Fields, and um, we were on a, we were in, uh, in Boston on a promotional tour, and two women named Susan <laughs> came up to me, one very short, and one very tall and from Maine, <laughs> Susan Goodwillie. Does anybody know her? <laughs> and, uh, and Sue Morton came up to me at this promotional event and said, now you know what the situation is with refugees. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I, you know, I'm an actor and I'll probably go, go on acting and do she said, no, you're not. And for 25 years, I was on the board of Refugees International, thanks to her. Thanks to her. I mean, it's a little bit like uh, what you're supposed to do when good luck comes your way. If somebody, if good luck comes your way, you're supposed to say, thank you very much. And, exactly. and that's what happened. So, so get on talk the, I would, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Well, I was just to say, and maybe talk a little bit about um, how Oceana came about, how you, how you said yes and who got you involved, and a little bit about that. Well, I have a business manager named Keith Addis, who's on the board of Oceana, uh, with an actor who has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Uh, with a kind of a similar past, actually, you know, sort of mm -hmm. New England person. And uh, Ted Danson was one of the, Ted Danson was at the beach with his children and they got oil on their feet and this was in California, and it made him so mad that they were getting oil on, his, on their feet that he, he wanted to know the reason why, because he was familiar with these beaches and you didn't used to do that. And out of that came, not in a minute, Oceana, but it was his founding Mission. American Oceans Campaign. Yes, and his founding mission, um, and persistence. So let that be a lesson to you all. And, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. So so they 
So they came to me and said, you know, you should be involved in this. And I said, well, let me come and visit and see what it's like. And, and at the first visit, I spent five minutes talking to Dr. Daniel Pauly, and I just wanted to be wherever he was. Absolutely. So great. Um, and, but for all of us who have served, as you have so effectively, Sam, on a nonprofit board, it's very important, isn't it, to have a sense of forward motion, of progress. Uh, all these institutions have goals. Um, uh, some of them measure them more carefully than others. I can say that Oceana is very metric uh, oriented, which I think is a wonderful thing, particularly in this field. Um, but I'm curious to know what has kept you motivated. Uh, you could do a lot of other things with your time. And of what are you most proud about what Oceana has done during your tenure? Well, I don't know whether it's true from Oceana's point of view or how true it is, but the, the thing that keeps me attached to it and makes me feel motivated is the sense of being useful, that, it's, that it actually leads to a result. And, and I'll give you an example of the, of the kinds of things that Oceana do, does that, um, well, I'm sure the governor could talk about this too at length, but something good happens for the ocean and you think, yippee, so nice, isn't that great? But the years that went before uh, are what produced that result. And the, 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 the strongest example, and the one that might have the most meaning for you, is that um, two or three years ago, maybe more, four, I was asked by Josh Lochran, who is the head of Oceana Canada, to come up and give a speech that he gave me a lot of help with um, about fisheries policy in Canada. And the fisheries policy that they were going to work on was uh, a fisheries act that basically said that the fisheries minister shall do about the fisheries what he thinks fit. That was, that was how Canadian fisheries were governed. That was the governing law. And Josh, just with his team, went at it. And um, this year, for the first time in 150 years, the Fisheries Act in Canada says the fisheries minister, minister shall protect the fish in Canadian waters and study them and know them and where they need protection or restoration, he shall get to work on it. No, those are not the exact words. <laughs> um, but stunning, stunning. And that's yeah. more fun so, than Barrel of Monkeys. Fantastic. And of course, ca Canada is barely 50 miles from here. And what happens in Canada affects what happens here in the Gulf of Maine and vice versa. Um, so uh, just a quick follow on on that, Sam. I mean, you mentioned Canada. But many in the audience may not know that um, although Oceana has been very proud and happy to be engaged here in the discussion over Frenchman's Bay and the proposed salmon uh, uh, penning operation, we are a global operation. And we have offices in, what, 10 or 12 countries around the world, including uh, the EU. Um, it really is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable operation. And when when Oceana uh, gets active in an area, it uses local talent who speak 
the language, both culturally and and phonetically, et cetera, of the country we're, we're in, whether it's Chile or the Philippines or Brazil, Europe, et cetera. Uh, and uh, same with Canada, the example that you, that you mentioned. So uh, how is it that you think we can be, as an institution, effective in so many parts of the world? What's the secret sauce that enables us to be global and yet have 225 successful policy campaigns in the 20 years that Oceana has been active. I think part of it is what what you said that it's that Oceana is hard-headed, hard on itself. Uh, it makes a decision to pursue a campaign, and it measures how it's doing in that campaign, and if it's not producing results, it wants to know the reason why, and if it decides that it was a mistake to have engaged in that campaign, it just seeks another campaign where it can be useful in that country. And it, it well, it's a wonderful thing. And, 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 uh, and then there is, something that Oceana found, I think, in terms of real effectiveness, most dramatically in Chile, where there was a, where there was a, a power plant, a copper refinery port um, that was planned for a very sensitive part and very, very valuable, ecologically, part of the Chilean coast. And a, an absolutely brilliant um, and determined leader there um, was, at a, was at an informational meeting about how this was going to go forward. And with his phone, photographed the phone of a representative of the plant who was sending facetious messages about what was being said on the stage and about what was actually going to happen and got that on the air and I, I mean I would need to be fact-checked on this for sure. But my story is that that event eventually led to the Chilean people realizing their own power and how much they cared about their own environment and their own oceans, which has led to a parade of really globally significant um, preservation and conservation and restoration events there and protection. And, and uh, so the lesson is, and it has been carried forward with Oceana into uh, a popular movement to prevent uh, oil drilling off the southeastern Atlantic which began with a, a bunch of governors who were very enthusiastic about drill, baby drill, and found out from the local population, particularly the coastal population, that they didn't want it. And the, the people found their voice and it was stopped. I, I hope you're listening. And I'd also say that um, Ted Danson was instrumental, along with a lot of the grassroots organizers, and was very active in being down there, and, and it was a really successful campaign, but Oceana does take a three-year campaign. You know, it's not just to your point that you have to be patient, and I always say, you know, no grit, no pearl. You know, that you, <laughs> it takes a lot of work and a lot of grit to get 
um, accomplishments like what Oceana has done. And I think the other secret sauce is that we work country by country, and each country has a 200-mile limit. So each country has the ability and the agency to protect their waters. So when you think about Maine, we, we own and we are responsible for 200 miles of ocean. And it's an incredible opportunity to say that is part of our ecosystem. It's not just you know the coastal inlets where we, we spend time and boat and sail. It is 200 miles. And I think that that, to me, is one of the, like the theory of change for Oceana is that we go in country by country, we hire people from those countries, and we work to enforce those regulations and make sure that those fish resources are available for those countries. And, you know, we just love that they have that understanding. Yes, and the key thing is that that's where most of the fish in the world live, Not is within the 200-mile limits of the country of the c countries with sea coasts in the world so save save those waters country by country and you will s you will save the oceans and feed the world which is did i say that already yeah and that's our vision you know that we can save the oceans and feed the world and we have a theory of change that that works and it's scientifically backed at, with advocacy, and we have lots of examples to show that. And I'd also say that in Chile, we worked with you know, a lot of opposition against these big salmon aquaculture farms, and we are now working with, I think it's about 20 grassroots organizations in Maine, um, and you know, looking at how to make sure that Frenchman's Bay stays as beautiful uh, and protected, um, you know, in terms of making sure that that the the water resources, the the beauty that brings in the tourism, it's something like a three hundred and eighty million dollar industry isn't destroyed by light pollution, noise pollution, effluent pollution. Um, so we're really happy to be part of that effort and hoping that. It takes a school of fish, it takes us all, it takes a community to do this, and we're hoping all of us can get involved to protect what we love, especially about this, this area. So Sam, we're coming down to the last five minutes. What was the question that you were so hoping we would ask that we completely forgot Oh, uh, to to ask you, oh Sue. Yeah, no, I, I would just um, I would love before you answer that question is um, that you're obviously in a position to do anything that you want, and we're so thrilled that you're part of protecting the oceans. And um, as you said, love the story about the killing fields and getting involved with refugees. But um, you know, just to answer the questions, like you know, why? we should care about the oceans, we pretty much know that, but why Oceana and what can people do? Um, well, I, I think we've well, pretty well yeah. answered that question. It is teaming up. It teaming is, up, exactly. It is getting together with like-minded people until you reach critical mass and your voice starts to be heard and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have Andy, Andy Sharpless is the CEO, oh, and brilliant. it doesn't hurt to have this amazing staff and Jackie Savitz, and, and the list is long, and Dolly Ramos in the Philippines. I mean, the, this is not a risk-free kind of work. Uh, if you're operating in countries with, with, where the rule of law is less respected or where there's a lot of violence. And these people, there was. they are, they know the risks and they're taking them F for the sake of the fish in the sea. It's, uh, it's really impressive. And for any of us to, I mean, it's, it, it feels to me, isn't it? Isn't it really a, a privilege to be associated with these people? 
Absolutely. I, I'll put the question right back at no, you. No, absolutely. I feel like it's one of the, like, we go to sleep at night and we say, you know, we are helping to save the ocean and feed the world and help give one billion meals of seafood to people each day because of the work we're doing that helps the poor and most vulnerable. And we have the results. It's not just elevating awareness, which is important, but we see the results. And, and we love the community. We love the Oceana family. And I guess what I would say is that, you know, there's so much information and so much noise in the world, like every single digital newsletter, everything that's coming at you. But I do think that if you become a wave maker and you just sign up for the Oceana newsletter, you get information that can help you decide how you want to act in service to our one and only ocean. It's, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful antidote to all the bad news. What, what you were speaking of in your, your wonderful speech, Governor. The good fight, Steve. It, it, the fight. Win or lose, the fight is a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it, it, if the ship is going down, would you rather be bailing or would you rather be cowering in your cabin? It's, it's so much more fun <laughs> than sitting on the beach and reading the bad news and thinking, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. Oh, that's great. Well, Sam, thank you. It's been such, such a pleasure for Susan and me to uh, host you and Lynn uh, here in our beloved island and state. Um, uh, it's just been a, a wonderful experience for us. And in terms of my hope for you in the future, I'm thinking, well, might be hard for you to beat Martin Sheen, but perhaps you could beat Jane Fonda. <laughs> You're talking about me? Arrests. I, That's I, I, right. I, I understand it's about arrests. Yeah. Arrests, getting arrested is to be recommended. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. The John Lewis. The John Lewis quote is absolutely right. It's, it's part of the same thing. It is, yeah. It's enormous good fun, and it's so much better than... <sighs> Sitting on the sidelines. Yep. Yeah. Got to get in there. You're here. Wonderful final word. Now, I believe we have wandering microphones in the audience. One is back there. Is there another one over here somewhere? And if you have a question... Uh, of Sam, please raise your hand, and uh, we have about 15 minutes for this section. Let's see if this is working. Yes, right over here. Hi, Sam. Uh, Hi. My name's Bo. I'm a teacher here uh, at the high school on this island. There's only one. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to say mostly, it's not really a question, but that's okay, that's what we do as teachers. So like to be active, you guys talked about, you know, we need community involvement. And the thing that I kept thinking about is that to have the energy for that activism, we have to be able to find joy. And the, you know, the last several years have sucked. The pandemic was brutal in so many ways and so much mental health um, stuff. But the thing that we had here, so, what I want to do is thank David and Susan because what we had here was this park. And every single person who talks about this park talks about your family. And I just want to say thank you so friggin' much. Um, thank you, thank you. There are two things that saved me personally during the pandemic, and I did a lot of activism. People who know me, I'm very bossy and very involved. One was this park, my best friend, and I swear to God, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting there, but the other was Grace and Frankie. It's the very first time I had ever streamed any TV in my life, and I, you saved me, so 
Thank you for the arts and all that you do. You inspire people in lots of different ways, not just through Oceana and direct activism, but we need to be joyful in order to be active ourselves. So thank you. This is one of those very rare occasions where Saul Bergstein and David Rockefeller are going to be found on the same stage together. Hi, Sam. Um, I'm a teacher at the college. I teach film studies here. I'm right over here. Hi. Hi. Uh, you're talking about turning points tonight, and 30 years ago, you were in a unique, amazing film called Mind Walk, based on Fritjof Capra's turning point. Bless your heart. And uh, <laughs> so you play a politician who's walking around Mont Saint Michel with your friend, a poet, and his friend, the physicist, played by John Hurd and Liv Ullman. And uh, when I saw that film my freshman year at the college, it really struck me as this is sort of like the human ecology core course with a lot of extra physics in it. And uh, you don't say this in the film, but the John Hurd character quotes you as previously having said that uh, politics needs to become the art of the impossible. And I would just like to hear you reflect a little bit on your experience in that place, Mont Saint Michel, with Capra's work and how that may have affected some of your ideas and what you think about the politics of the impossible and where the limits are of politics and philanthropy. Thanks. That's a small question and easy to answer. Um, that's the talkiest movie I think I've ever been in in my life. And it was a, it was a fascinating experience and I think it made a wonderful film. And just quickly, um, John Hurd recites a poem by Pablo Neruda on the sands, um, on, the, on the sands, you know, when the tide is out, the sands that you can walk out for miles away from Mont Saint-Michel. And when they start, when the tide starts to come in, you can hear it going from a really great different distance. It, it growls. Um, John Hurd recited that poem um, as the tide was coming in once, and as he finished the poem, the tide came to his feet, and he said, uh, which, what was in the script, I think we better go now. <laughs> so, I mean, I think in a sense what that guy was talking about when he said the politics of the impossible was politics. Because politics is almost by, am I, Correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> it's kind of an impossible job to please everybody. Um, and how to bring about change and bring people along with you is really uh, an impossible job. But politicians do it, get up every morning and do it, and the good ones leave a trail of good results. And, and I think the same is true for good organizations like Oceana. How do you get people to see what seems obvious to us? Um, why, why do fishermen and conservationists, why, why do fishermen sometimes see conservationists as their enemies? How could anybody conceive of an organization that's trying to make an abundance of fish be there for fishermen to catch for the rest of time conceivably be seen as something that you have to oppose? And yet, and so how does those, that's an impossible job for Oceana, but it doesn't stop it from being the job. 
It is the job. So I think what he was really talking about is that's, that's what we all kind of need to be doing and, and, and not allow ourselves to be defeated by the impossibility of things. Sorry, that was a stupid answer. Hi, Sam, uh, right over here. And uh, thank you for being here. And the Rockefellers, thank you for being here as well. Um, many of us here are passionately concerned about the ocean. So we're already on board. But there's a lot of America uh, that does not believe in science, that is not as conscientious about the future. But they do consume Hollywood. What can we do through Hollywood or other ways to bring in other people that may not be as passionately concerned about this stuff as we are? Um, I'm going to give you a really stupid answer <laughs> uh, because it's so general. But, um, but I played Abraham Lincoln, and his advice uh, to people um, who wanted to to get ahead in politics was to find themselves a bunch of rowdy boys. And I, I think that was 19th century speak for what John Lewis said, you know, make good trouble. It's, it's, uh, isn't that the same, isn't that the same formula and isn't that the only real formula there is? I say that as the child of an enormously civilized man who was always looking for all the different facets of a thing, but but really, you gotta you gotta fight. All right. We have and some people. I'll with make hands my way over here. here. And somebody with their hand up over there too. But you can't be in two places at once. Um, hello, my name is MJ, and um, a friend of mine, Dr. Caitlin, uh, runs the boat for Acadia Tours out of Oshi. It will always be Atlantic Oaks, just locals, you know. I don't know what that name is. <laughs> anyway, um, and we were having dinner one night, and she was talking to another gentleman who runs one of the other whale watching boats, and they were just like, just talking, like, just like a matter of fact. And I'm sitting there with my jaw on the table because what they were saying was they are looking for the whales going more south than up toward, you know, 50 miles toward Canada. And it's because the fish that are normally down like in the Rhode Island area are coming up here because the water's warmer. And I was like, Oh my, you, know, you keep hearing on the news all the time, like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I was like, I mean, they're just talking a matter of fact. And I'm like, that's scary. So thank you guys for what you do, and I'll get involved, whatever you need. <laughs> thank you, thank oh, you, thank you. Thank you, you. For the roads and the park. I'm not good at bikes. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hi, I'm Camille. Um, you guys were talking about how you wanted to keep Frenchman's Bay as protected as possible. Do you guys have any future plans to create marine protected areas in Frenchman's Bay or anywhere else in the U.S. at Oceana? Wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that. I don't know. Is the, is the, I know that Oceana is active in establishing marine protected areas and very active too in places where there are paper marine parks trying to turn, well, working to turn them into actual marine parks with some success. The ones that come immediately to my mind, maybe, maybe you have information on this, but are in Europe, but. But Chile. There have been very important advances. So we, we have done this in other countries, and um, yeah, we're just board California members, too. and we don't know all the plans that may be uh, out there. But if it is something that you or others feel that we should take on, by all means, 
write to us, write to Andy Sharpless, whom you may have seen earlier. Uh, we have to be very selective, and we have to believe not only that there's a scientifically good reason, but that it's a winnable battle. And uh, so we'd love to hear more if you believe that uh, that is something that we should do. Thank you. Tell us. And, yeah. I, and I would just say that, you know, Frenchman's Bay is a really healthy ecosystem, and that is one reason why Oceana is organizing around helping on the American Aquafarm project, helping to stop it. But, you know, and I will also say that Oceana is very supportive of aquaculture, but different forms, bivalve and kelp and other forms of um, freshwater. But when the, the ratio of wild fish to farm fish is three to five times more, we don't look at that as a, as a good way to use the wild fish of the ocean. Hi, Sam. Hi. Uh, my name's Sean. Um, I'm a professor of ecology, and I also run um, a school on the west coast of Canada, uh, Marine Science Center. Uh, Darren was kind enough to invite us to attend this session, and the session, o Oceana's plastic session with Andy and uh, Jackie was great. Um, I want to bring this back to Daniel Pauly uh, a little bit because uh, he really is a, a brilliant scientist. Um, and he's influenced a lot of students uh, to come and learn at our Marine Science Center. But the students are also asking, how can we get more involved on in solutions on a global scale? Because it is one ocean. The heat domes that we're seeing on the west coast, this, the Gulf of Maine is heating at an unprecedented rate. But we have the evidence for the change, but what we need now is evidence and science for solutions. So how do we get to that global stage where we can start to really work together? Because COVID was a great example of how scientists came together to find a solution for a vaccine in 15 months, I think it was. And so I'm just imagining that same sort of global rally to save the oceans and, and, and the role of science. So what's the role of science in that? Thanks. I could take a stab at that. Go ahead. So, um, you know, one, program that I am particularly proud of is something called Global Fishing Watch that uh, Oceana and SkyTruth and Google, they came together and they created this, it's almost like a surveillance system um, for almost real time um, transparency. So each government can look and see where fishing vessels are and whether or not they are going into their, the 200 mile limit or not, and you can train, they can literally, the mapping is amazing. So I think the technology that actually creates radical transparency that we can then create accountability is the future and um, the ability to then prosecute accordingly. And then you, you can actually trace the illegal, um, unreported, unregulated fishing and not have that fish land. Um, you know, either in the U.S. or other port cities. So I do think that will be more useful and hopefully more countries will adopt that. And it is happening and it's been fledged, that particular um, initiative that Oceana worked with Google and SkyTruth on is now fledged as a nonprofit and doing very well. Dr. Daniel Pauly at the moment advocates, as he has been for a number of years uh, for the reduction or, and or elimination of national subsidies for national fishing fleets. And that addresses both the pressure on the fish populations of the world, and it is a global solution to that, but it also we have more and more, I, I, I bet this doesn't apply locally, but globally, we have way more fishing activity than we need, and the result is that there is much more uh, carbon pollution than we need to have, and we could be getting the, the same or 
with a little restraint, better yields, um, and and two to four percent, I believe, is the number, uh, the contribution of fishing globally to to carbon pollution. So, and just the other thing I would say is that you know, apropos of the subsidies. For many years, I mean, that was the silver bullet. Everybody would say, if we can get rid of the subsidies and actually subsidize more of the, you know, artisanal fishing fleets and reduce the amount of these huge industrial fleets that, that obviously, you know, they have the great technology and the radar and sonar, and they are just taking everything. And the amount of bycatch is just... It's horrible. It's beyond horrible. They, it's just dead, decaying fish that they throw back into the ocean. Um, so I think subsidies, if we, could, if we could somehow reduce those subsidies, we can then work on really addressing better fishing gear, better ways of really maximizing the fish that, that these fishermen want to fish and catch, but not at the expense of the amount of bycatch that gets stuck, you know, whether it's the whales, you know, the dolphins, the turtles, and all this other fish that isn't being used. So right. do we have time for I think one we have more one, question? One more, David, I believe. I'm going to come all the way over here. Just one moment. All right, Elaine. Thank you. Speaking of global, so my apologies. I'm Kenyan-born, so I didn't know about you until tonight in terms of your films. And so this has been helpful for me as a Kenyan to understand within the context of what we can do collectively. I just noticed that there's a lot of mention about the One Ocean and not so much about Africa and the role that um, Africa can play, not only in the dialogue itself, but also recognizing some of the work that's happening there and that, how that ties in with all the effort that we do right here in America. And I say that with all due respect because I live here on Mount Desert Island, but I am a child of Africa, and so my heart belongs in both places. And Kenya uh, sits on the Indian Ocean, and I'm involved with this group that does daily work um, along the Kenyan coast between ocean cleanup with the plastics. And I'm proud to say that my friend Lily Pugh, who came with me to Kenya, saw firsthand some of that work. Um, and uh, th thankfully, the Pew family has been funding some of that, that work, and I believe there might be a connection to Ocean. I'll have to research that, so I want to thank you for that. But I think, for me, what kills me half the time is when a dialogue is happening and Africa is left outside of that conversation. And so I'm constantly trying to figure out how to create that connection that allows all of us to rally behind the idea and the vision so we can all, as one world, work together. So I don't know if it's a question of a co or a comment or a bit of advocacy, maybe all of the above, but thank you for your time. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of your participation, your listening, your questions, and uh, your activism. Uh, Sam, you are fabulous. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, further on the Oceana board, uh, and your leadership is inspirational. Uh, and thank you, thank you, thanks to the College of the Atlantic for hosting this, and I think Darren gets the last word. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I do get the last word. <laughs> and the first one is, is just thank you. It's been wonderful. I feel like the, it's been a whirlwind of a week for sure, and I've come away knowing and understanding things so much better. But I've, I've compiled a little best of, um, and each of my slides uh, begins with this theme of of awe. Remember, we talked from, from the get-go, talking about um, awe and reverence. How do we create awe and reverence for the world? But before I get there, thank you. There it is. Um, you should know that there have been almost 4,600 registrants 
that have been involved in the week, uh, which is really amazing. Across 11 different countries, 11 different countries, you don't, not loads of people in the Philippines, but there were one or two. And look at the bl blue dot there is Kansas. Kansas, and I'm convinced it's because Bob Ballard was from Kansas, so everyone in the state was, was there to, to hear from Bob Ballard. Um, but each, um, each slide, so on reverence number one, thank you to our staff, yeah. right? <laughs> thank you, especially to Sean Keeley and Wes Norton and Jen and Caitlin and the development staff. But real quick, this is Richard Dow, right? Richard Dow uh, works for Dan Daigle in the buildings and grounds. And when Brian Scarry was here, he was like, it's too light in here. We need to make this place more dark. So the team ran out to parodies and bought all of the drop cloths and were closing up the, the, the light spaces. So um, that, that was where that story is. And um, the takeaway, not having anything to do with, with staff here, is there is an incredible power in storytelling, right? And like Tara and Justin said, um, sometimes when the stories no longer resonate, you just gotta change the storyteller. So that's takeaway number one. On reverence, um, number two, for bringing people together and asking, hey, what's gonna come out of this place, right? What's gonna come out of this week? And I love this picture of Assistant Secretary of State Monica Medina and uh, Jackie Savitz talking, and I'm just biting, uh, biting my nails, wondering what's gonna come out of this conversation, right? Uh, the, the, the second thing, again, having nothing to do with awe and reverence here, but plastics, they might be perfectly reasonable for an artificial hip, but you don't use a substance that never goes away for something you wanna throw away, right? That came from Jackie Savitz herself, right? <laughs> Awe and reverence, number three, the power of art and music. One of the best experiences of my week was when we finished the Wednesday session and the music started playing up on the hill. It was magical. There is power in music. There is power in art. Takeaway message number three. We talked about warming waters earlier, uh, that inspiring all kinds of change. We learned this week that muscle spat settlement becomes unpredictable in warmer waters, right? We heard that from Fiona de Koning. Awe and reverence number four. I loved the way all of the participants spent time with College of the Atlantic students. We are the College of the Atlantic. It's all about the students, and that was absolutely amazing. Here you see Andy spending a time with the group. Um, takeaway number four, this is important. Susan and, and, and Sam both mentioned it. In a weak democracy, People tend to feel less empowered as citizens, right? And they fall back on the false power of consumption. We're not going to buy or recycle our way out of the plastics problem. It's gonna have to happen. The change is gonna have to happen upstream. Number five. God, this thing, guys, come on. Awe and reverence through the power of breaking bread together. Every day we gathered a small number of people, guests, and some of our board members, and it was incredible the conversations that happened afterward. And number five, in terms of a takeaway, um, is about resilience. And it's about what we can do through restoration. Tanasia talked about this. Restoration is at its best when it's not nostalgic or reactionary. Right? And over the course of this kind of restoration, we've learned that people and communities can be restored as well. Number six, awe and reverence. This is a shot of Zach Cliver out on the boat testing ropeless gear. And we've learned, and I have this awe and new reverence for human ingenuity. 
Takeaway number six, we talked about data. Storytelling can become very, very powerful when matched with data. And data, just in knowing what is out there, can be an incredible driver of behavior change through the transparency it creates. Awe and reverence, number seven. I love this word. I have awe and reverence for scrappiness. And the women we met this morning were incredibly scrappy, totally embracing the main can-do attitude. The thing I took away from this, um, the, the quote I just couldn't, has no relevance at all to scrappiness, but it's when Fred Benson said, I just went out and I bought five lobster rolls. The total price was $9 less than I paid for my first car. We've got to hail the vertically integrated aquaculturists, the women warriors of aquaculture. Awe and reverence for difficult stories and having the will to move through them. This was from the incredible, incredible first session on Monday night. And the takeaway story number eight, the U.S. has 11.35 million square kilometers in its exclusive economic zone only number two behind France, yet we still have failed to ratify the law of the sea. Awe and reverence, number nine. I've got it for young people. This was one of the most amazing pictures that, that I came across during the week. And it happened not just with the little kids, it also happened with high schoolers talking with Fiona and with Joe and the other aquaculturists. We have amazing hope because of our young people. And I left this week thinking, wow, there is a future. There is hope for the future because of our young people. I can't, I can't say enough how much I thank, thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm really kind of torn up here. And um, this has been an incredible, incredible week for the College of the Atlantic, uh, largely because of everything you have brought to this community. And on Monday, you're going to get a bit of a survey um, asking for your advice on what we can do better, what we should do differently, and importantly, what we should do next year. Um, and believe me, come next week, we're starting to plan the thing next week. So I'm going to go take a rest. And um, I want to again once thank you for all the time and energy for Sam, Susan, and David for closing us out today. And just from all of us at the College of the Atlantic, thank you very much.